Hello and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Mary Garson and I'm representing the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry. And I'm going to have a conversation this morning with Emeritus Professor Francis Saparovic, a colleague of mine who works at the University of Melbourne here in Australia. Frances was the first woman chemist to be elected to the Australian Academy of Science and she in fact actually has a very interesting background because she was born in Europe. So Frances, maybe just to, to get us started, please tell us a little bit about your career and why you came to Australia. Oh, good morning Mary and thank you. And I'd like to remind everybody that we're the first five professors of chemistry in Australia, first five women professors of chemistry and it was so recent. And that's why I think it's so important to have this Women in Chemistry Breakfast, which you started. Congratulations. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about myself. I was actually born in Croatia and I came to Australia with my parents as a little girl on a ship. And it took us a while to get here. And by the time we got here, we didn't realise that we came to the wrong country. My parents thought they were emigrating to America, but we actually came to Australia by mistake. And I'm so grateful that we did. And then my father ended up being a miner in Broken Hill, which is in Western New South Wales, Central Australia, very dry, very harsh environment. And a, a, a little bit more about me, so you sort of get the context, is that my dad finished first grade and my mum finished second grade at school. So they weren't that well educated. And I'm the first person in my family to actually finish primary school. And I did very well at school. I primary really school? Primary school, yes. yes. <laughs> Low university, high school and university. And I really didn't know what university was. And at school they told me that, you know, there'll be people like me at university. So I was really looking forward to going to university, but I'd never found the people like me. And I dropped out after the first semester, or not even the first semester, it was a term in those days. So this was 1972. And I didn't enjoy the university experience that I had. And I joined the CSIRO, which is a government research institution in Australia, as a junior technician. And it wasn't until my son was born that I realised I wanted more out of life. I particularly wanted more for him and for him to have a better life. So as a single mother, I went back to school. I went to technical college. I worked full time. I studied part time. And in technical college, I did chemistry and I didn't enjoy it because they, it was all about rote learning and I didn't like that much at all. And I decided I was going to do maths and physics because you didn't have to remember stuff. And so I went to Macquarie and they wouldn't give me a science degree because I didn't study chemistry. So I've got a Bachelor of Arts in maths and physics. And by the time I finished um, my degree, I realised I enjoyed research. I really enjoyed learning. And so I decided to do a PhD. By the time I finished my PhD, it took about 16 years, right? I was studying part-time, working full-time the whole time. But by that time, my son grew up. So I took leave of absence from CSIRO and I did a postdoc at the National Institutes of Health and I decided I wanted to be an academic. And so I was very fortunate. And in 1996, I got a job as a Associate Professor of Chemistry at the University of Melbourne. Wow, that's just an amazing story and it really, I think, sends this wonderful message of if you really want to do something, um, it's out there for you, isn't it? Now, um, you've been a professor at the University of Melbourne for more than 10 years now, um, but what I really wanted to talk to you about today was you told me recently that you had an opportunity this year to go to Antarctica with a group of women and that there was a leadership component to this voyage. And because one of the themes that we're developing for this year's Global Women's Breakfast is about growing uh, leadership, I just wondered if you could tell us a little bit about how you were, about the trip to Antarctica and the group of women that you were with, and also a little bit about what you learned while you were there. So first of all, it was amazing to be with women. You and I know that we're often the minority and throughout our careers, we've often been the only woman in the room. So it's a very unusual experience to be with a hundred women. And uh, it Did also they come from Australia or from all around the globe? At least 33 countries. So yes, I think we spoke about 45 different languages, but we all spoke English. So lucky for me, we could communicate quite well in English. But all around the globe, and these were women in STEM. 
And it, we were the fourth cohort. It's, the program is called Homeward Bound, and it's not just the voyage. We have at least a year of at least monthly and different types of um, projects, webinars, learning experiences, Facebook, Zoom, um, even coaching. But you know, we, we went to Antarctica, and the thing that struck me at first was the majesty of the place, how insignificant humans appear to be and how beautiful it is. But then you how long was the voyage? We were how on the voyage for three weeks. Yeah, so it was away for a month. And it's a long time to be away from work, but it, it was a and great How long experience. were you actually on land in Antarctica? We landed uh, every day, except twice. So uh, we sailed the Drake Passage, and um, that was at least two or three days. But then, you know, we, we landed about 18 times, I think. Yeah. So that's pretty amazing. You'd have half a day of uh, lessons and then half a day of landings. And then in the evening, we would um, discuss things and have things happening all the time. It's a very full program. But the thing that it taught me was the importance of diversity. So yeah, we're a very diverse cohort of women, but we're all uh, women in science, women in STEM. But it also teaches you that you need men as part of your team. So that for me was a very interesting experience. And what about the leadership issues that you teased out uh, amongst the group? What were the outcomes? Oh, uh, you, were telling me, you were telling me a little bit about some of the language, the um, inclusiveness that the group discussed. Yes, there is, is that, um, how we present things, what, what makes women uh, respond a certain way, but to me, it was about hearing people. And it isn't just men and it isn't just women. We have to listen to all voices. And um, the other thing was, usually when they teach you about leadership, they teach you about being confident. And for me, that makes me feel less confident because I actually am not that confident. And it was interesting to see how people um, wish to present themselves as such. And, and that how we tend to think of things like vulnerability and emotion as not strengths, but the program also taught us that that was our strength, showing our vulnerability, um, showing our emotion, that also drives you and gives you strength to go ahead and achieve. Being with these women who are very successful women, it was also good to see how they, ha it wasn't necessarily good to see, but it was good to learn how they struggled. Each, each and every one of us, the people who were very young to the people very old, not necessarily old, but you know, from 23 to 70, we have a range of experience, but all of us struggled and we overcome the struggle. And it made me realize that I wasn't particularly special. I mean, it happens to many people. I think all of us do, and we don't appreciate it. We don't share that vulnerability with our colleagues. Yes, I think we've sort of trained or taught ourselves to appear to be completely confident. And in a way, we're not really authentic when we're like that, are we? Because, I mean, everybody has that sort of little inner circle of wondering, could I do this better? What do I need to do next? Um, so it's kind of interesting that on a voyage like that, as well as learning and finding out about other people, you also, as you've described to us, learning a lot about uh, yourself. So that must be a wonderful experience, but you, you haven't finished this year long activity. You, you said that you were going to continue to, to uh, network with this uh, group. Um, how many of them were chemists, by the way? I mean, you said they were women in STEM, so that's across all of the sciences. Um, oh, presumably it, both it, physical and biological. I, I didn't feel that way. I, it, yes, I did meet people who were chemists, but in essence, to tell you the truth, I think a, a lot of us had biological experience, and you know that yourself, that in biology we tend to have more female. But there were women who were pilots, you know, there were women who were um, engineers, you know, these traditionally male roles. But chemists, I think, I, I got quite excited when I met someone who had a chemistry background. <laughs> there weren't many of us who were, you know, straight chemists. Who were straight chemists, yeah. Now, look, since you got back, you I don't know whether you were glad to put your feet on terra firma, because I know that the only time I went to Antarctica and I flew, 
the bit between Tasmania and Antarctica was the worst flight I've ever been on. So I know that the voyage uh, that you would have undertaken could not have been very comfortable. Anyway, you're not now safely back in Australia, which is wonderful for the rest of us. Um, but, but just tell us a little bit about what you do when you're not being a chemist and not being a women leader in the chemistry discipline. And what do you do when you chill out? Well, Mary, it's difficult not to be a woman chemist, isn't it? But no, <laughs> I, I do love going to the theatre. I've become a, a um, you know very middle class Australian. And mm -hmm. you know, the other night I went to see the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra who were playing um, the background to 2001, which was fantastic watching the film and listening to this magnificent music, which brought tears to my eyes. But mm -hmm. um, I, I love going out to eat. I really like going to restaurants with friends go, and occasionally going to a cocktail bar. Love walking around cities. I travel a lot and I just love to walk and see places and take public transport actually to get the real feel of a place. Yeah, for, for the benefit of people who are listening to us, um, Melbourne is a very cosmopolitan city and it's exactly as Francis describes. It's got wonderful restaurants and certainly walking around um, central Melbourne and looking at the parks and things is is uh, very nice to do as a tourist. Uh, many of the people listening to us are going to be young chemists thinking about their future in chemistry. Um, and you know that's part of what the networking event that we're running today that we're going to be running in February is going to be about so have you got any tips or any suggestions for young women who might be thinking about taking up a career in chemistry the chemical sciences well one of the things I realized when I was on the voyage was things are getting better they really are and it made me reflect during the voyage how uh, it was difficult when we were younger but it's improving and um, we, we loved our careers, we enjoyed it, and I think it's going to be even better for the young people coming through today. There can be nothing better than to go to work every day and enjoy what you do. And chemistry, if that's what you really enjoy doing, go ahead and do it and make sure you network and meet people and talk to people and get known in your field. Even if you're an introvert, try and say hello, it's, it works. Yeah, I think it's really important to be passionate about uh, what you do. I, I agree with you on that one. Um, now, I look, I've just got one final question for you because this webinar is going to be part of the uh, material that we provide to the women who are attending the uh, Global Women's Breakfast on February the 12th. And at the time of making this recording, we already know that we have more than 100 events in more than 35 uh, countries. I think that Croatia is one of them. Um, so uh, given that women are going to be celebrating achievements and accomplishments and networking during the breakfast, um, what, what do you personally think is going to be the importance of that event and what do you think it might be able to lead to? The importance is it raises the profile of women in chemistry. I think before IUPAC started doing this, women weren't as visible in chemistry. And the, the Women in Chemistry Breakfast helps us also to network, to meet with one another. What do I expect to achieve from this? Lasting well, relationship? Well, I mean, the, the global community um, yeah. that we're trying to grow through running these breakfast events. And chemistry and science is definitely international, and this is a great way to do this. Thank you, Maria. Yeah, so I think one of the things that I've noticed is very much that we discover that it doesn't matter what country you come from, many women chemists, particularly young ones, are facing up to exactly the same issues. And so by sharing experiences and sharing ideas, uh, I think that this can be beneficial to, to everybody who joins into the network. And we're just so grateful to IUPAC for being willing to act as an umbrella organisation to, to actually um, host the network. Uh, so Francis, thank you so much for talking to us today. I guess you're going to have breakfast in Melbourne, aren't you, on February the 12th? I'm going to be on an aeroplane. I'm <laughs> going to. Uh, <laughs> no, you're not going to I'll see what breakfast. I can do. Well, I it's just as well we captured your thinking today. You're going to be on a plane traveling to 
Germany, there's a biophysics meeting they invited me to give a talk. So I thought, you know, I'd retire, that the things would slow down, but you know, I'm still keeping my lab going, but I am gradually going to retire and I'm really devoting more and more time to promoting women in science and women in chemistry. Right, so when you have breakfast on the plane, you have to raise your glass of orange juice and say, I'm joining in, even as a singleton, to the breakfast. So I, I, I'm actually going to be in London, UK. I'm not going to be in Australia. So I'm going to look forward to actually connecting back to my friends and colleagues in Australia um, by GoTo or Skype uh, ahead of our own breakfast um, in the United Kingdom. Anyway, let's hope that the event goes very well. Francis, thank you so much for talking with us today. Your experiences in Antarctica are just sound absolutely fabulous, and I'm going to investigate the program. Thank you very much for giving us your time. Thank you, Mary.